Welcome to tonight's London Luminaries Lectures. 12 historic organisations working collaboratively together to share our collective history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be your host for this evening. So it's with great delight for the last time in our, our 12th lecture to be able to introduce our fantastic chair for this evening. She's a professor of literature, she's a trustee of Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust and an eminent broadcaster. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Chris, and to all the other partners in the Luminaries series. This is sadly the last of our current series of Luminaries lectures, and um, it's been a great delight to meet uh, the, the faithful and to connect with you in this way. It's been a pleasure having so many of you attending more than one. I know some of you have attended almost all of them. Now, this talk is a, is a standalone talk, like all of the others. You don't have to have watched um, any of the others. But if you do want to connect them up, go to our YouTube channel and watch them. For example, tonight is, uh, is a talk on Boston Manor House. In a previous series, we had a really amazing talk about the lands and, and public uh, park around Boston Manor House. So that would make a really nice connection. This year has been about themes which connect the arts and politics and power. And this is going to be another on the themes of poets, painters, uh, patrons and politicians. And our speaker tonight gave a wonderful talk last week on William Hogarth and his connections with those themes. John Collins is the Historic Houses Senior Manager for the London Borough of Hounslow and is currently preparing to reopen Boston Manor House later this year after an extensive refurbishment funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And his title is The Benefits of Befriending a Prince. Over to you, John. Thank you very much. And I'm very uh, honoured to be closing out this series, um, a series so good that I decided to come back twice, uh, having presented last week on Hogarth House. Uh, this week, uh, I'm going to be talking about Boston Manor House, a 17th century house in Brentford, but talking particularly about its, a spell of its history in the early 19th century. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to um, start on July the 10th, 1834, when King William IV and Queen Adelaide came to dinner to see their friends, the Clitheroes. This was the first time that the King and Queen had done so with commoners, and Mary Clitheroe would write, their majesties honoured old Boston House with their company to dinner. They came to by Gunnersbury and through our farm at our suggestion. It is a much more gentlemanly approach than through old Brentford. The people were collected in numbers and Dr. Morris's school, and they gave them a good cheer. We let the boys through the garden into the orchard by the flower garden where my brother had given leave for the neighbours to be and it seemed that if 200 were collected. We had our haymakers on the opposite side of the garden and kept the people, hay carts, etc. for effect and it was cheerful and pretty. The weather was perfect and the old place never looked better. So we're going to talk today about how we got to that point and how the King and Queen and the residents of Boston House, now Boston Manor House, got to know each other and a bit of background to that. So how did we get here? Uh, to do that, let's look at Boston Manor House. This is Boston Manor House, much as it would have looked at the point where that royal dinner happened. Um, at this point, the house, as you see, it would have been built around the 1620s. Uh, and by the time of the 19th century, um, the Clitheroe family had been well established there. This is Colonel James Clitheroe. He was um, a descendant of the Clitheroes, whose hands the house had been in since the 1670s, when they bought it from its original owner and builder. At the start of the 19th century, Colonel James was the head of the family. Um, he'd been born in 1766 and had married Miss Jane Snow of Langton in Dorset. Um, the Clitheroes had made their money through uh, trade and through business in the city. Um, and although well off in terms of the time, they were considered as commoners. They weren't part of the aristocracy in any way. Colonel James had taken an active interest in the local community and was part of many good works. Uh, he was the chairman of the visiting justices of the Middlesex County Lunatic Asylum in Hanwell, which he helped to found. 
Uh, he'd given land uh, for a school in Ham. Uh, he'd given financial help to uh, Brentford workhouses. He was the treasurer of the Isleworth almshouses. He was a magistrate. And he gets his title for the fact that for 46 years, he was a colonel of the Middlesex militia. Uh, colonel and Mrs. Clavero's house at Boston were shared by their sister, Mary. Uh, Mary was two years older than her brother, James. And she's one of the principal sources for what we know about the relationship, but more of that later. Um, it seems that it's about 1824 when they become acquainted with the Duke of Clarence, who was then resident at Bushy, and the Duke of Clarence is, goes on to be William IV. Here seen after his investiture, but we need to talk a little bit about the King and Queen as well to understand quite what you're coming from here, uh, which is two very at the time, different parts of society. William IV was the third child and the um, third son of King George III and Queen Charlotte. Uh, he spent his early life in Richmond at Kew Palace. Um, and it was very much, he was a centered around West London. It was, it was very, um, very much a kind of a haunt of the royals and particularly royals who were in line for the throne, but not directly. Uh, at this point, as the third son, he was not expected to become king. And at the age of 13, he joined the Royal Navy as a midshipman. He seems to have had a relatively interested time, although the credence you put to the sources is disputed by some, but he seems to have uh, both been keen to do his fair share of work on the ship and cooking and cleaning, and even got into a fight with some of his uh, crewmates in Gibraltar and was arrested, although released soon after it was realized he was. William would also serve in New York during the time of the uh, American War of Independence and an unusual moment uh, as he crossed paths, although not personally, but in the intentions of George Washington, uh, who approved a plot to kidnap him while he was in New York. Washington would say of the plan that presented to him, the spirit of enterprise so conspicuous in your plan for surprising in their quarters and bringing off the Prince William Henry and Admiral Digby merits applause. And you have my authority to make an attempt in any manner and at any such time as your judgment may direct. I am fully persuaded that it is unnecessary to caution you against offering insult or indignity to the persons of the Prince or the Admiral. It turns out that this never really got going, and um, it was effectively because as a young man, still in his early teens, he was effectively wandering around the streets of New York unguarded. Um, William seemed to be uh, quite the character. He was holding court with a governor in New York, aged just 16. And by the age of, well, by 1876, he was a captain of his own ship. By 1879, aged just 24, he'd become a rear admiral. Um, he wanted more titles um, and, like his two older brothers, wanted to be a duke. And his father wasn't keen uh, to force the issue. He decided that he would suggest that he may run for parliament in Devon. And it seemed that that prospect uh, was enough to have him made Duke of Clarence and St Andrew and the Earl of Munster uh, in May of 1789. By 1798, he's an admiral. Although he's never given command throughout the Napoleonic Wars, uh, despite him asking multiple times. In 1811, he was appointed to the position of Admiral of the Fleet. Um, the slide which you just got a glimpse of there, which I'll move on now, is if that's his life abroad, uh, his life at home was equally as interesting. This, you see, is Dorothea Jordan, with whom William had 10 illegitimate children. Dorothea was an actress, uh, sort of known by her stage name of Mrs. Jordan. Um, they had so many illegitimate child children that they were created in their own surname of Fitz Clarence, and they stay a part of the royal household long after the relationship, which lasted for nearly 20 years, ended in 1811. And now slightly older William's attentions are elsewhere. Uh, he is addressed by two circumstances. One is the fact that he is out of money, and more than that, he's in debt. 
uh, his allowances are spent and beyond spent. And when the relationship with Mrs. Jordan ends, she speaks publicly and thinks, in fact, it is the fact that he's in debt that is causing him to look for a wealthy wife. 20 years, they were never married. So all those illegitimate children with somebody much below her station. Uh, that relationship ends. She's given a stipend uh, on condition that she never acts again. She does end up acting again, and unfortunately, that means she loses out on her money. Uh, she does so to try and help a family member who's uh, impoverished. She takes up um, acting again, and she ends up uh, dying penniless in France. But the illegitimate children stay part of the royal court. The other factor that influences things and starts to propel William towards the different life that he would have in later life, the life that brings him into contact with each other at Boston Manor, is the fact that by 1817, his father, George III, was left with 15 children, but no legitimate grandchildren. And effectively, this creates a race, both for his sons to marry and for those sons to produce children. And William has a distinct advantage when it comes to this race. He's the youngest at 52, and he's also the healthiest of the three. His brothers had no children and wives who are past childbearing age. So it becomes quite clear that if he lives long enough, he'd almost certainly become the British king and the king of Hanover. The race is sort of on to get him an eligible wife, and he's not universally successful in this. Um, he's pipped by rivals to other potential wealthy and appropriate wives. Uh, his younger brother, Ernest Adolphus, goes to a tour, effectively, of Protestant Germany, looking for um, an eligible wife and thinks he's found exactly the right person. William rejects them. Um, but I don't know quite how uh, genuine that initial offer was, because Ernest Adolphus ends up marrying his suggested wife, William, himself. It turns out that by 1818, a suitable match is found, and that's Princess Adelaide of saxe Maringia. At that point, she was then only 27, so it's a great match. It's the right station, and she's of childbearing age, which is extremely important. And it's also mentioned that her willingness to accept the um, illegitimate offspring that uh, William has produced before into the household is a really strong part of the attraction here. And on July the 11th, 1818, they are married um, in the drawing room at Kew Palace. And conveniently for William, given his um, achievements, if that's the correct word, uh, he's given a new grant from Parliament, which puts an end to his debt issues. His marriage does a lot of things. It changes the perception um, of the man who, previously, if you look on the caricature to the left, of the Windsor pair, this is of um, the happily married couple, the appropriately married couple. And you compare it to the cartoon by Gilray on the right uh, from over 10 years earlier, which fairly um, graphically displays uh, Mrs. Jordan as the pot and the king as the half figure. No, the future king is the half figure you can see. There's a transition point in William's life here, and that's what it brings him to the Clitheroes. Um, they seem to meet the early 1820s and become friends. Uh, this seems to con we have it implied through Mary Clitheroe's letters that they met several times at their house in Bushy. This very blurry picture is part of our collections and collections that will actually be going on display when Boston Manor House reopens to the public this summer. Um, I'll tell you what you're looking at. This is the invitation to the coronation of uh, William IV, um, written in the King's uh, hand, inviting the Clitheroes to attend friends for six years at this point, um, this coronation invite really seals the status of people who, as we said before, are in every other respect commoners, but seem to be good and true friends of the now king and queen who have uh, overtaken uh, George IV after his death in 1830 and become King William IV and Queen Adelaide. And it's that relationship that um, seems to produce this incredible friendship that lasts for the rest of their lives. 
Um, the Clitheroes were frequent guests at Windsor, but they weren't really courtiers. They didn't behave like courtiers and they didn't receive the kind of favour and the kind of political machinations that come with being courtiers. Um, they never attended um, drawing rooms, the, that opportunity to politic and gain favour. Uh, and it seems like the Colonel and his wife seems to have only done one occasion which would have kind of said to the people at the time that these were courtiers. Um, on that occasion, it was Colonel James and his wife Jane uh, without his sister Mary. And on that, the Queen remarked, I knew Mr Clitheroe would not come. It is too public. She had almost left off going out till we made her come to St James's. It's the letters of Mary that give us the insight into this. After almost every visit they seem to make, she writes of the visit and those records of those letters have remained. And they give this incredible glimpse of what it was like for people in the station they were in to be elevated to this. Um, Mary writes to a friend in November of 1830, I can hardly believe that I feel as much at home in the royal presence as in that of any other society, but it is the fact. It is seven years that my brother and Mr Clitheroe have been noticed, but I am only just come out now. For many years my health did not allow my dining out, and I got so out of the habit that I avoided it, and quite escaped being asked to Bushy until the Duke became king. So you see the inference there that the Clitheroes are dining at Bushy frequently before, um, and it's only the elevation to um, this new position that really means that Mary doesn't feel she can refuse the invitations. Um, she writes that uh, before um, George V was buried, they were invited um, no, to a meeting, uh, to a, a gathering where only the royals uh, and the Fitzclarences were present. Um, and she mentions that they all did the honour to talk to me, the king calling my brother, calling me my brother's Princess Augusta. And I'll come back to that shortly, actually. Um, she then writes, so that actually in less than five months, the little old maid of Boston Manor has dined seven times with the king of William IV. And honestly, I have liked it. Um, that Princess Augusta comment really sheds light onto the incredibly unusual um, status relationship that was going on here. Um, it seems that the families were so close that after he accedes to being king, um, the king nicknames Mary Clitheroe, Princess Augusta, in allusion to her being the old maid of her family, as the Princess Augusta was the old maid in his. And there's accounts of um, him inquiring to her, trying inquiring about her to the Clitheroes, uh, where he would say, how is your Princess Augusta? And the Clitheroes would respond, how is your Princess Augusta? You see this incredibly familiar relationship forming through the letters. And Mary Clitheroe writes quite a lot of letters. From them, we know that the Clitheroes are dining with the King and Queen. When news comes that the Prime Minister, the Duke of Wellington, has resigned, uh, partly in opposition to the policies being pursued by the King and those he favours. Uh, we know that in April of 1831, they spent three days at Windsor Castle. Mary says that the beauty, splendour and comfort of which is not to be described. Uh, she goes on to talk about how on Sunday between church and luncheon, we were summoned to the Queen's own apartment to present her a picture of Bushy House. She looked at it for some time and then turned to Jane and said, I shall value it. You know how much I love dear Bushy. Again, an incredible glimpse into the fact that Bushy was the place that was granted to William when he was a much younger man. And it's where he was effectively given Bushy and the rangership of the park because of the children that he had sired illegitimately. It was space for those 10 children and where they'd grown up. And the family seems to continue with all of those children actively part. And Mary refers to them frequently as being present at all of those occasions. Um, she relays quite intimate details of the sort of functioning of um, how the Clitheroes were present. She talks about that trip to Windsor, that three day trip to Windsor in 1831. And she says, the king came up and said, ah, my two princess Augustas, this is very comfortable, now to business. She had the official boxes, pen and ink already. He unlocked a box and set to work signing, the princess rubbing them on blotting book and returning them into their cases. He signed 70, 
Three times he was obliged to stop and put his hand in hot water. He had cramps so severe in his fingers. When he had signed the last, he exclaimed, thank God, tis done. He looked at me and said, my dear madam, when I began signing, I had 48,000 signatures my poor old brother should have signed. I did them all, but I made a determination that never to lay my head on my pillow till I had signed everything that I ought on the day, what cost me what it might. In his old age, the responsibility seems to have grasped William and the Clitheroes seem to be privy frequently to somebody who's not pursuing particularly raucous pursuits, but genuinely as trusted friends. In May of uh, 1832, um, Mary writes that lately a command came to my brother and Mrs. Clitheroe to come to Windsor um, and stay till the Wednesday. There were no other visitors. There are fantastic glimpses through Mary's letters. She's very proud of the access that's coming to the family. Um, she's also very proud of the fact that so many of the dinners have service where there's no clattering, which I'm not sure if that's a personal preference, but um, she talks of that visit in May. Each evening, the Queen, and Jane, the Queen would call Jane to her sofa and work table, where also no one approaches but by her invitation. And on Tuesday morning, the King took my brother all around the castle with Wyattville, giving orders and directions. I fear greatly the improving mania is upon His Majesty which in these times will be very unfortunate. It seems that on the same trip, the Queen took uh, the Clitheroes for a long drive, uh, as Mary writes that after the long drive, she took them to her room and clasped a bracelet around Jane's arm, begging her to wear it for her sake. And as the stone was an amethyst, the A would remind her for Adelaide. To my brother, she presented a silver medallion of the King, telling him her name was on the back and he must keep it for her sake. Um, the title of this talk is Benefits of Befriending the Prince. Um, there are very few tangible benefits that seem to come to the Clitheroes, apart from the support and friendship of the monarchs and obviously the status that comes with it. Um, but one of the benefits seemed to be around this trip because in the same one, they were given tickets for the Royal Box at Jury Lane uh, with a note to admit the Colonel and Mrs. Clithero. Um, they asked was this two places and there would be other people who'd be attending with them and they were told actually it's seats eight but it's just for you it's a, a kind of a signal of their their friendship that they had access exclusive access to the royal box um they really did socialize with them um in the winter uh, of 1833 um they followed up trips to both the birthday parties of the monarchs earlier in the summer with spending three days in brighton um, each day they were there, they dined at the pavilion uh, and they talk about, they have such intimate access that they know how well the king and queen are. They, Mary often remarks that the king is particularly well, the queen is particularly well and the converse. Um, she's very proud of this and it seems to culminate in, for them in all these royal visits around 10 years after the friendship starts, the royal visit to is reversed and the Clitheroe's host um, we know quite a lot because, unsurprisingly, Mary writes in quite close detail about what happened. Um, they arrive fairly late in the day. We talked about their procession through, um, passing through Gunnersbury rather than Brentford. Um, we know that they arrived at seven that evening and sat down for dinner at half past. They were received in a new library at Boston Manor House. Um, so we see Mary's letter. Um, she talks about the Queen walking around the gardens, even to the bottom of the woods, uh, part of which is still visible in the park, which is Boston Manor now. Um, Mary writes, the haymakers cheered her and all had a pail of beer. And when she came round to the house, instead of turning in, she most good humouredly walked to the flower garden and stood for five minutes chatting to the party, which gave the natives time to get her dress by heart. It was very simple, all white little bonnet and feathers, remarkably similar to a scene we might see today where royals are scrutinized for what they're wearing as they meet a group of the public uh, who are hemmed back from them. Um, it's interesting as well that Mary notes that the king had hay fever, which is why the queen was, was doing the walk. Um, they, they had sat down to dinner that night um, and said that it was a great disappointment to the people that the party had been separated. Um, 
Princess Augusta had a slight cold, the king had a slight touch of hay fever. Um, however, it still meant that the police needed to be kept order around the house um, and all the bells of the churches rang merrily. Uh, once they got into the library, there were 19 people sat for dinner. Uh, the library room was still existent. Again, one you can see when the house reopens this summer, although sadly, uh, no longer a library. Um, it's not been fitted out the library as it would have been since later in the 19th century. There were meant to be 20 for dinner, but the Duke of Cumberland, Mary dutifully informed us, was delayed by the House of Lords and couldn't come. Uh, she writes at the dinner, uh, as to the dinner, it was so perfect that it was impossible to know a single thing on the table and that, you know, must be termed a proper dinner for such a party. My brother gave carte blanche to Sir Edward Kerrison's Englishman cook, and to give him his due, he gave us as elegant a dinner as I had ever had. Uh, she gives a fantastic glimpse of the fact that um, we were well lit with wax on the tables and lamps on the sideboards, and many a face I saw taking a peep through the window. Uh, the room was cool for the Queen asked for the sat top sashes to be down. It's a fantastic image of the fact that this is happening on a ground floor um, with the windows open in the summer. And you've effectively got locals, I'm assuming kind of not commoners, but people associated with the household taking a peep at this royal dinner occurring inside. Um, we know that the evening lasted till about 10.30. It's a relatively short night. Um, but not until the Queen had requested that the guests, accompanied by the Princess Augusta on piano, uh, and including Colonel Clitheroe singing for the entertainment. Um, when they left, it's written that when they went, the sweep of four people were present to see them go, and their majesties were cheered out of the grounds. Um, it's fascinating, she gives insights to the fact that they, the Clitheroes brought their nephew into the room as a sort of after dinner for a treat to meet the king and queen, and that they all spoke to him and spoke well of him afterwards. An absolutely intriguing insight to the Princess Augusta, the real Princess Augusta of the party, uh, talking to the little nephew about playing football and rugby and cricket and talking about how she played cricket with her brothers and thought herself quite good at cricket, which is just an intriguing insight, although it's obviously coming from um, an eyewitness to it. It seems a very odd thing not to uh, be completely true and a glimpse that you might not expect of uh, for women in the royal household. Uh, Mary says in a later letter that she doesn't quite know how much it costs. And obviously we're used to stories um, of royal visits being ruinously expensive. Um, she makes an estimate though, although she says no one's told her, she tries to make an effort. So she looks at the fees for borrowed servants, for ringers, for the police, uh, for carriage of things from and to London, and she guesses 44 pounds. Um, she also says, never was, never was less dry wine drank at a dinner, and that I cannot estimate but six pounds, I think, must cover it. We had two men cooks, uh, for he brought his friend, and we got them all they asked for. Really, I think we were let off very well at 50 pounds. Now, to give a bit of context as to what 50 pounds is, there's a lot of ways to convert this, but if you use purchasing power, the modern day value of 50 pounds is about 7,000 pounds. So really, you're looking at hosting a royal dinner for in today's terms, about 350 pounds a head. Although obviously people can take issue with the calculation there. There's lots of ways to convert money from one time to another. The relationship continues. Um, we know that they have lunch at Sion in 1835. Um, and we know that in the same year, the Queen Adelaide Fund is started by Colonel James Clothero. Uh, continuing the work he'd started at the local asylum uh, and he has Queen Adelaide as the patron uh, of the charity that's named after her. Um, all of this is happening in the later life of the family um, and when we move, uh, move on to Boston Manor House again, um, William didn't last much longer after the friendship um, of the events we've been talking about. Uh, he died after a short illness at Windsor Castle. Windsor Castle, we see here. Um, the Windsor that the Clitheroes would have visited so many times. Um, and after this short illness, 
1837 and he passes away. The Clitheroes themselves didn't last an awful lot longer after that. Um, Colonel Clitheroe died in 1841 and Mary and Jane Clitheroe died in March of the same year. Um, Boston Manor would pass to General John Clitheroe, who was James Clitheroe's cousin. That succession for Boston Manor House actually resulted in an end to 170 years of Clitheroe's passing the house from father to son. Although General John Clitheroe was almost certainly a guest at that list, he seems to be referenced as one of the people who attended. Uh, so there is a connection uh, for the house. What it did mean, though, is that William IV was succeeded by Queen Mary, um, but Queen Mary, by Queen Victoria um, to the British throne. Although, interestingly, not to the throne of Hanover, which still required a male heir, it was the previously mentioned um, Adolphus Ernest, the uh, younger brother who succeeded to the throne. So it ended the separate, it caused the separation, uh, the death of William IV of the British and Hanoverian thrones. And the end of our story about Boston Manor House, the Clitheroes and the King and Queen. Uh, to say if anyone's interested in volunteering, uh, at Hogarth's House, we're holding a volunteering fair on the 9th of March. Uh, we've got 17 West London heritage uh, organisations. And at that, uh, you'll be able to come along and see uh, what opportunities there are to get involved at Boston Manor House, at Hogarth's House, and at many of the houses that have taken part in the Luminaries uh, series this time around. And those people listed just here but thank you very much for your attention thank you um very much john for a wonderful talk um one of our um audience members has just said what a treat to have so much gossip <laughs> it's sort of royal yeah. gossip to end this talk it really was fantastic and as we've already said um this is the last of the present series but everything from this series and our two previous series are available on our youtube channel <laughs>